Is that, an invi Is that an invitation, Michelle? Mm -hmm. well, we're starting. Good evening um, and welcome to this Elliott Bay Community Conversation uh, during Black, uh, Women's History Month slash uh, Black History Month. Uh, and uh, before we begin, I do want to acknowledge that we have sacrificed our land to make the city of Seattle a beautiful uh, reality. And we are still waiting for our justice. This was, these are the words of uh, Cecile Hansen, chairwoman of the Duwamish tribe. We encourage you all to find out more about the Duwamish uh, Longhouse and their cultural center. Um, the links are in the, the chat. Uh, so uh, it's a privilege to be, to be here. Um, I am Eric Parsons, and I am the Director of Community Engagement for the Elliott Bay Book Company. And it is my distinct honor to be in the company of five extraordinary women. And I can't wait to introduce them uh, to everyone. Four of the women are the architects of the Black Future Co-op Fund. You can see that logo behind uh, the architects. Uh, and the Black Future Co-op Fund is Washington State's first philanthropy for Black people, founded by Black people, uh, to improve the state of our communities, um, and really to ignite Black generational wealth, health, and well-being. So let me first um, introduce the architects. Uh, Andrea Copain Sanderson has dedicated her career to advancing racial equity and economic mobility. She currently serves as CEO of Bird Bar Place, a historically black organization in Seattle's Central District that supports people's health and prosperity through innovative programs and advocacy. Angela Jones has worked in education more than 25 years and strongly believes equitable access to education is essential to community sustainability and generational growth. She is the director of the Washington State Initiative at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where she leads the foundation's strategy to create positive and sustainable impact for students, families, and communities throughout the state. Michelle Merriweather strives to be, in her words, an effective voice for the voiceless, advocating for African Americans and other communities who have been systemically excluded from economic and educational opportunities. She is the president and CEO of the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle, where she leads advocacy, programming, and coalition building to improve housing, education, health, and work, uh, workforce development for Seattle's Black communities. Tawana Nobles is Senator for the 28th Legislative District of Washington State. In addition, she serves as the President and CEO of the Tacoma Urban League, where she leads programs to strengthen and support the local African American community and social equality and economic independence. And I should tell the, uh, let people know that I left out, these were very brief bios, I left out all of the advocacy and community-based uh, bodies and committees these women serve on, because if I read all of those, we'd be, that would take up the whole hour. So these, these are four extraordinary women doing something, uh, I think, quite remarkable at a critical moment in our history. And the last person, last but not least, the queen we'll to introduce, and uh, you know, she is an architect of her own. Uh, when you think about what Vivian Phillips has put together over the decades of her service to Seattle, to black communities and to culture and arts, uh, if it's noteworthy, 
if it is community driven, if it's something that's beautiful, if it's something that's going to touch our souls. Um, she has been involved either through uh, giving advice, uh, uh, guidance, uh, approval, um, but without Vivian Phillips, I really believe Saddle, uh, Seattle would be uh, bereft. So thank you all, all five of you for being here. <laughs> and we're here to talk about um, several, several things. Obviously, uh, first and uh, well, first books uh, and uh, tying that into the Black Future uh, Co-op Fund. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, maybe you could hold up your books so that people can see the books that are on display and available at the Elliott Bay Book Company. Um, but these are books that they have chosen that they think that uh, we should be reading. Um, and uh, I hope everyone can see those titles. Um, and Vivian, you are not holding up your book, but I know which book you have. Oh, thank you. You can't really see it, but I, I chose J. California Cooper's The Future Has Passed. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I like that. <laughs> and I love J. California Cooper. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing her to our attention because I fear that she is going to be forgotten if we don't call out her name. Um, Eric, someone in the question in the Q and A is asking us to say the name of the books. Happy to do that. Or we can put it in the chat too. Well, we could say the names. Let's say the names. Should I jump in with mine? Jump in with yours. Mine is the Wealth Care Putting Money in Its Place by Hill Harper. And you chose that book for a specific reason I know, Angela, because I know you're very concerned about because our, our infrastructure as a community, we have to change our relationship with, with, with finances, our, our relationship with, with money. We have to be okay with, a, with responsible abundance. Like there's so many reasons I chose this book. We, we have historically not been allowed to be okay with abundance and to make sure that we're taking care of each other and generations of each other. I love that. Michelle. I chose the 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah-Jones, the great Nicole Hannah-Jones. And um, I chose it because it is our origin story and the Black Future Co-op Fund, uh, we say we want a truthful Black narrative. And I thought that um, this book truly coincides with what we are trying to create. And we also say we wanna be good ancestors and this is filled with stories and narratives and pictures of um, our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Vivian, why did you choose J. California Cooper? Um, I chose J. California Cooper for a very personal reason. Um, one is she is someone that I had the honor and pleasure of knowing before she passed away. And she did pass away here in the city of Seattle. She was living oh, here. I didn't know that. Yeah, and just as you said earlier, I do fear that she will disappear from our um, uh, our literature, literary history and knowledge if we don't continue to lift her up. But also more personally, as the Black Future Co-op Fund is focused on uh, remembering what ancestors did and laid the groundwork for, and also being good ancestors, J. California Cooper is one of those ancestors that I think gave us a lot of simple, really simple, simple lessons. So that, that's why I chose her. Oh, wonderful. She sure did. Yeah. Andrea. So I chose my book, uh, Just As I Am by Cicely Tyson. Um, it's an autobiography of her life, you know, stories from her upbringing, various relationships and her life challenges and successes. Um, but I chose this book because I've, similar to Vivian, um, for personal reasons, I've, I've always looked up to and admired Cicely Tyson. 
Um, she was this physical, graceful, artistic, and spiritual embodiment of my grandmother. And at Black Future Co-op Fund, we talk a lot about our grandmother's influence on our lives um, and in how we became to be who we are today, inspired by our grandmothers. And so Cicely Tyson and my grandmother, they were actually both born in December, although my grandmother was just a few years older than Cicely. But my grandmother shared her likeness, um, their beautiful black chocolate skin, um, her hair, their cheekbones, even their height. They were both about 5'3", five, 5'4", five, and the energy they both exuded, right? Strong, black, take no nonsense women, which is what my grandmother taught me. And as Barack Obama stated about Cicely Tyson, she not only shaped our history as a black people, but she shaped history, right? That's powerful. Um, and so although she was in show business and she did modeling and acting, what, what I get from her is that she used these mediums to break down barriers. And, and during a time when it was unpopular to do so, even in high stakes, right? So she used her show business, her platform to transcend racial and gender boundaries. And my grandmother did the same, but in public service life. Uh, my grandmother could have went about her life being a wife, a mom, a homemaker, not making any waves, but she stood up for black people against colonialism and in service to women's rights. These two things are what brought her into the public service domain. And then of course, they both hailed from the Caribbean, which is where I'm from. Cicely is from the island of Nevis. My grandmother and I are from British Guyana. Um, Cicely and my grandmother and I are descendants of slaves. And we understand our responsibility quite like the Black Future Co-op Fund in carrying forward what our ancestors fought for and sacrificed. And so this book and her stories are representative of a lot of my life and our hopes and our dreams as Black people. Tawana, I love your book. Tell us about it and like these essays about you know, self-love and healing. I, I, I love your book. Thank you. I love it too. I chose the book Life, I Swear. And um, I don't know how to pronounce Chloe's last name but i follow her on on instagram now but chloe dolce i'm not even going to try l something beautiful and <laughs> elegant and powerful um but i chose this book because it is a collection of essays but i want to um read a couple of things so that folks know um the purpose of this book so um this page says yes sis this book is for women who know women and for women who love women, for women whose identities have been questioned or whose heart aches have cut through their sense of self over time. This is for black women whose voices have been silenced to the point of disassociation. And for those who kept their stories to themselves waiting on pride or fear to pass. It's also for women who believe that healing is our birthright and that joy cannot be stolen. For women who trust the liberation and learning that come from sharing and listening. Our stories are ours and they are sacred. This book is for us. And as a Black woman who is still growing and loving and healing and has, you know, I have so many stories um, and just so much more um, life to live. I love this book because too often, we do think that there is a point where we must arrive before we can share or a point where um, we must arrive before we are completely whole. And I think it's just, it's an evolution and we are um, you know, whole at any given moment and alive and well. And I love this book because it also talks about, especially in the work that I do as a, a CEO and a state Senator, where oftentimes folks look to me to be the messenger. And there are just amazing quotes in here, like how, you know, we can be a mess in a messenger at the same time. And we need healing while also we can help to heal others. And we don't have to buy into the, the binary aspect of who we are or these polar opposites of I need to either I'm a mess or I need to be completely put together, um, but it is okay to evolve. And I think this book just validates um, how dynamic we are as women and the many journeys and growing pains that we experience. So, um, I just love it. And, and it, there's an, another quote on here that talks about when you tell your truth, I become more accountable to my own. And the more opportunities we have to hear someone else's truth, um, 
we can become more accountable, I believe, to our own as we're healing and just becoming um, just more deeply in love with who we are as women and as Black women. So I hope many folks will um, get this book and read it and reread it and take notes and adore it as much as I do. I hope so too. Um, given what all of you have just said about your books and encompassing uh, the legacy of, of slavery, uh, honoring our ancestors, our grandmothers, um, self-love, healing, um, amplifying uh, forgotten voices, um, what, what were the visions that you had that created the uh, Black Future Co-op Fund? How did, how did the four of you, and Vivian, I know you were, in, you were involved too, how did, how did you come together to create this unique, historic, radical effort to fund Black communities, specifically Black-led organizations throughout Washington State? Michelle, this is your question. <laughs> How it always comes on me. Watch. I'm going to tell my version and watch as soon as I finish, they going to say something else. So let me start though, since it's my question. So none of y'all say nothing. Um, so in, in, of course, in 2020, while we were all at home, um, sheltering in, in place, because of COVID, um, the tragedy, the tragic murder of George Floyd happened and our communities um, and our people and people that didn't look like us all took um, to the streets and said, uh, no more. Um, and, the, and I was talking to each one of these fantastic women um, separately and independently about what uh, was happening um, for Andrea and I, I was just checking on each other because we are direct. Uh, we were direct service in organizations here in Seattle, um, going through a lot, and we checked on each other often through COVID and and our work. Uh, and when um, the uprising was happening, we were serving our community. We were serving meals to those that were in the streets protesting, and our our work just got really hard and really tough. And we were just checking on each other. Angela um, immediately started texting like, who is, who, who's got the black agenda? What are we doing? And, and how can I be down? Like what's happening right now? And, and Tawana and I are co-conspirators, partners in, um, in this work as she leads the uh, Tacoma Urban League. And ironically, um, just before uh, the world shut down, she and I were in Olympia advocating for, um, our organizations and those that we serve and echoed in Olympia uh, were uh, the same questions. Where's the agenda for, um, for your community and those you serve? So uh, when this all happened, I, um, uh, I said, okay, like enough of having separate conversations, let's all get together and have one conversation and literally overnight, um, literally, the Black Future Co-op Fund was born. Um, well, we didn't have a name yet. We said we were going to do this thing. And we met with some folks in philanthropy and said, we have this thing because we want to, with the positions that we play, um, match the voices um, of those that were um, protesting uh, and um uplifting their voice. We wanted to match their voice in philanthropy. And those that we met with in philanthropy said, yeah, sure, let's do this. And we were like, oh, okay, hold on. <laughs> so we, we, cause you know, we're used to hearing no in our work, right? <laughs> we're used to hearing um, a million different questions and wanting things flushed out and ironed out in a long proposal. And we didn't have any of that. Um, we just had a concept and a passion and an energy and they said, yes. And um, then of course they were like, what's this called? And we said, hold on, we'll get back to you. And we came up with a name and they said, okay, what do y'all want? We said, hold on, we'll get back to you. <laughs> and we said, we want $25 million. Um, and then we, and then they said, what's, what's this gonna look like? And we said, hold on, we, we'll get back to you. And we, we reached out to Auntie Vivian and said, we need some help in coming up with how to tell our stories. And, um, all of that literally 
um, I am not exaggerating, was probably took probably a week, maybe two, wow. uh, for all of us to um, come together and stand this up, maybe two weeks. Um, but here we are now, two years later. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah, I have nothing to add. You did it. You hey. Heard. Yeah, but Michelle's being a lot gracious. Here we go. Because what happened also was that we got tired of being tired. And we were like, we see our younger generation, our younger folks in the streets making demands. We need to be making demands too. So it was more of a demand, not even an ask. It was, we demand that you uplift our Black communities. We demand that you resource our Black communities. We demand that you hear us. And thereby was born the Black Future Co-op Fund. So Michelle, that was wonderful. That's actually factual, except... We demanded, we didn't ask. That's true, that's true, that's, that's true. true. That is very true, that is very true. And I will also say, um, uh, while I, I did not march this time, I, I think it was just because I was tired. I wanted I wanted our young people to, to do that and we certainly fed them and, and resourced them. And, um, but I, I, wanted, I wanted to do something different. I had, you know, we all have, um, a level of um, privilege and responsibility and connection um, that we needed to leverage in this in that moment uh, and still do. So we we used it. We used it. And Vivian Phillips uh, helped to come up with what Vivian what did you want to come up listen, with? listen I have a weakness and a strength and it's called when my people call me I respond you know and that's just I just I can't help it and I will say that you know I, I have had the pleasure of working as a strategic advisor um, consultant to pyramid communications and so I can take no credit singularly for how this all played out. I was, I had a piece in it and I tried to play my role. You know? um, but, but honestly and truly, when I heard that this was happening, when I heard who it was, and I happened to have been in the conference room at the Urban League when Andrea and Twana and Angela strolled in and I was like, well, wait a minute, what are y'all up to now? And uh, I was hooked. Uh, the strength, the authenticity, the determination, the vision that these women had, have and had was something I wanted to be a part of seeing come to fruition. And I'm just delighted to have been a part of working through the strategy of what the goals and vision uh, of the Black Future Co-op Fund are and helping to articulate that to the public and draw support. And I I'm thrilled. And Kara Palmer is on. She's not on camera, but Kara has been my partner in good trouble as it relates to the Black Future Co-op Fund, along with a whole team and a cast of thousands. <laughs> but um, it, it's you been- You know I'm coming off mute, right? I'm coming off mute, Andy Viv. <laughs> I'm off mute because everybody does have their role they've played in this. And I want to be more specific about the Vivian Phillips because we oh, talk it. about 10,000 things. We talk and we talk and we talk and we talk. And she will listen and listen and listen and not say much. And then she'll say like, I think this is what you're saying. And we're like, there it is, <laughs> boom, there it is. Like, and even if you look at our backgrounds and you look at the colors and you think about the fingerprints and all of those things, um, she helped us unpack what it is we were really trying to get to. So yes, I, and if it, all, any of my partners feel free to add. <laughs> it's all good. We, we knew it, we knew it. Thank you. <laughs> I, have, I have this thing about the radical imagination, how a radical imagination that we often see in, in literature, for example, helps to point a way forward. And how do you, what, I'm, what I feel about the Black Future Co-op Fund is that here is this institution run by, uh, these four women who 
are really engaged in uh, liberation and transformation work. Is that is that an accurate assessment? Okay, it is. That's what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> it, is. it is. It is. I will see. I always say this. I I get to share space with a senator. I call Andrea the preacher. I call Angela the teacher. And of course, Vivian is the queen. So I was waiting for the, actually for that question, I was waiting for the preacher to step step in. I was wondering I why she's she got a word. So quiet. I know she got a word. Quiet. Yes, yes. Absolutely, it's radical imagination. You know why? Because we're changing the paradigm of philanthropy, right? We have told, we're each grantees. So the four of us came to this, not with prior experience with philanthropy and being philanthropists rather, but being grantees. We understood how disadvantaging it has been to seek support and resources from philanthropy. So we created this fund to show philanthropy. It is that simple to reimagine it, to change the paradigm. We're doing it. We've done two rounds of grants and we haven't raised our $25 million yet, right? We've raised $12.9 million. And what are we also doing? We're turning who we are, the stories we tell about us to the world on its head from a positive perspective, from a glass half full perspective, from the successes of our stories, from our dreams and our hopes, and not from a deficit perspective. So absolutely this is radical imagination. Shall I go on? <laughs> Let the church say amen. <laughs> uh, and this, and then the names of the of the the grants, the We See You grants, and and earlier this week, you know, as I listened to all of what you were saying, then I, I I've been thinking about what Judge uh, Katanji uh, Brown Jackson has had to endure this week, um, uh, and I saw earlier, a few days ago, a picture of her seated at the confirmation hearing, but she's kind of blurry. But what you see is her daughter. Have you seen that photo and how the pride and the love that her daughter had, has? Um, I mean, that's kind of, I could be, I, I modestly say, that's the kind of pride and admiration I have for you all. Um, earlier this week, it was announced that you had given uh, 21 grants, um, is that right? 50,000 unrestricted funds to uh, Black women-led organizations uh, in areas of like culture and arts, educational, innovation, policy development, um, restorative healing, how important was it, is it to you to um, support Black women-led organizations in this way across the state of Washington? I'll tackle the we see you question and then please, my fellow architects. <laughs> it's literally we see you out here in these streets doing this work. Right, so the first round grants that were given out on, they were, that were awarded on the, the, the anniversary of the death of George Floyd was, we see you out here in these streets. Then the second round that came out during Women's International History Month is, we see you out here in these streets. We continue to see you. And what that means is that we are awarding you and it's by no means enough for work you have already done. Right? We see you out here in these streets doing this work. You're on the ground doing this work. You are the experts in the work. We see that. We see you. We hear you. We feel you. That's it. That's really it. Thank you. And thank you. And thank you. I, oh, go ahead. Andrew, were you going to, did you have one more thought? Okay. I, I wanted to read a, a quote from, from, Hill Harper's book, you can't be free if the cost of being you is too high. Mm. We wanted mm. to be us, but the cost has been so high. And so when we were thinking about Black women leading in the state of Washington, when you think about how we have historically defined ourselves as strong, unbreakable, all of these things, that's a high cost. 
you know, there's strength in being vulnerable so that our mental health is not suffering, so that our physical health is not suffering, so our spiritual health is not suffering. So our thing is like, they've been doing the work under-resourced. And so, you know, so what can we do to try to level the playing field? As Andrea said, it's not enough money. We know that. Um, but, but how can we start to fund into a way that our organizations can be sustainable and be connected. The other thing about the grants is once you get a grant or you participate in our business certificate program or, or the, our board fellows program, um, we invite, we're like, welcome to the Black Beach Co-op Fund family. And we have family meetings. And so we gather every so often the, the folks that are already working with us in the family through any of those programs so that we can also be connected. And, and, and build the infrastructure, you know, for us. So it's even bigger than the money. It's, hey, did you know somebody else in Vancouver is doing this work? And you guys can have thought partnership or somebody in Spokane or Bellingham or, you know, Snohomish County or whatever. So we're also trying to do those pieces, which the cost is not as much for that, right? And so, you know, what, what does that look like to continue to build so that the cost of being us is not too high? Can I also add that one of our We See You grants is with us here today? <laughs> Vivian can Phillips. We, can, we, can we talk about that? that can we talk that about program? that? Yes. Um, because we, we wanted to let, um, uh, we call her Auntie Viv, let her know that we see her too um, and recognize um, the work that not only that she's, that the 21 jobs that she has right now. <laughs> Um, but the, the history that you talked about, Eric, that she had and the foundation that she has led um, and left here in Seattle, we, we just wanted to let her know that, yeah, we appreciate the work that you are doing for the Black Future Co-op Fund. We certainly would not be where we are right now without her work. Um, but we also know and recognize the work that she has already done uh, and, and invested in. Um, Seattle and the CD and her children and in all of us. So we wanted to say thank you. Um, and so we also look forward to the work that Art and War is going to bring to um, 23rd and Union. So yeah. thank you. Vivian, just, just say a little something about Art and War so that people who don't know will know. Yes, but can I, before I forget, can I just go back to a radical imagination and the, the question that you posed? And for me, thinking about how radical it is for these four women to own their own agency mm -hmm. in the world, in, in, in Washington state, but in the world, mm -hmm. and to go about doing business unapologetically secure, confident, and don't care about what anybody else has to say about it. That's radical to me because they are the exemplars of living a liberated life, right? They're doing liberating work. They are liberating other folks. And the goal is to make that possible for everyone in Washington state. So anyway, but, <laughs> but I had to say that because that's uh, something yeah. that, 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 you know, kind of flows through my mind constantly about what the Black Future Co-op Fund is. But yeah. I am such a proud recipient of one of the We See You grants. And it took me some time to really embrace the fact that they were saying to me that they do see me. I know they see me. We see each other once a week, <laughs> right? Every week we see each other. But for them to um, say, we see you and we see that you are building this container called Art Noir that is a place where you can bring all of the energy, the resources that you want back into the Black community. So as it says in the, in the chat, we are creating a space to celebrate, honor, and generate prosperity for Black artists at the corner of 23rd and Union. Um, and uh, having been a part of the Midtown Complex development, being from Seattle, being from the central area, I know the pain that my people have been feeling 
about the loss of sacred ground in this community. And I wanted to be a part of reinstilling, reinstilling a sense of ownership. So uh, the, the We See You grant will help to complete the construction <laughs> that we are in right now and um, move us even closer towards ownership because we are actually purchasing 3,400 square feet. So we'll have ownership in the Black community. When I say we, it's not me. It is Art Noir, which is a nonprofit organization, which means it's owned by the community. So that's what we're doing. Vivian. May I chime in for a second? Aunt Viv was like so like, I don't know, I'll use the word gracious again, about talking about her influence on us four ladies in the fund. It helped to have an elder with us intergenerationally, she encouraged us to step into that power and that radical imagination that she's seeing. We did not do that without her. We could not do that without her, right? And so it is no coincidence that our logo includes what looks like fingerprints, which is from a DNA perspective, we wanted to always connect the work that we're doing intergenerationally with those who came before us to those who will come after us. And so it was vital and it is vital, regardless of Aunt Viv's artistic ability, her intelligence, just her wisdom and being a black bodied person who's experienced the traumas, but also the joys um, of our black people. It helped to have her on this journey. It helps to have her on this journey with us. Without her, we could not stepped in. We could not have stepped into that radical imagination and step into the power that she sees. You know, they drug me kicking and screaming into accepting that I'm being an elder. <laughs> I was like, who are you talking to? But, <laughs> but no, I, I, they've helped me. They have helped me <laughs> to really be free about, you know, the aging process and about owning my own wisdom. I love it. It's a two-way street. It's a powerful two-way street. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, the Black Future Co-op Fund talking, or part of its mission, I guess, I could be wrong, but this uh, uh, telling the truthful Black narratives. Um, what, has do you what has what has had a significant impact on you this is this is for anyone to answer but on you in your work in your thinking what narrative of the last several decades uh, do you think has kind of ignited something within you It's telling our stories from a perspective of strength, of survival and thriving, rather than a deficit perspective of the Katanji, the Katanjis making it to the seat in DC and Congress at that table, to the Dr. Benz locally who decided one day, I am going to leave. I am going to be where I need to be. Um, all of us, each of us, the, 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 the five black women on the screen determining for ourselves where we are going to be versus where we have to be. Um, I think that's been shown through history, told through stories that um, at some points in time, we were made to do, right? We were forced to do, we gotta do. And what has that done for us? Right. In some instances, I know it was about survival, but our ancestors fought so that we could have this choice um, to operate from a different perspective. So for me, in the past several decades, it's been about strengths based and about thriving and stories of thriving and stories of hopes and dreams and not stories of deficit about black people. And that, you know, the, picking up where, where Andrea left off, that's the piece for us to drive that because so many of our people believe the narrative that was created for us, not by us. And so how do we push out narratives 
um, with the through line of strength, with the through line of excellence, um, to know that we are in every sector. We are a resilient people, that we were excellent before you know, you know, things were done to us, whether it was slavery or, or Jim Crow, you know, that there was always a threat of excellence. Um, and so, you know, that was that's the piece for us that we want to uplift that story. And we, and we know we're not we're not perfect, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're not a monolith and not everybody's perfect um, in the entire black community, but we want to highlight, um, again, as Andrew mentioned, things from a position of strength. I mean, that even goes for like, like data instead of weaponizing data. How do you come from a, a positive place? And so we're really excited about um, a report we'll put out in June um, that um, Andrea and several other folks um, from another team called Cardia have been helping us and Pyramid um, to, to think about for, for Black health and well being. And so, again, that's another way of talking about us from a place of, of strength and also identifying so, okay, what other work do we want to do for, for and with our people? Is there a particular uh, program somewhere in Washington State uh, that any of you might want to just say something about that really speaks to what we've been talking to uh, talking about tonight in regards to community, uh, telling a truthful Black narrative, uh, belonging, um, anything that you have uh, has really touched you and that you really believe is going to make a uh, you know, a transformational difference, uh, wherever the program might be. I, oh, <laughs> um, I won't name a specific program, but I'd love to share the types of programs that we're funding, because I think um, the ways that Black women have been showing up in community to, to be fixers, to find solutions, to bring joy, to ensure that our artistic abilities and creativity um, are um, given a platform, a stage, and, and um, provided an audience to give other people joy. I just really feel so proud of the, the type of work that Black women are leading across the state. And so we're funding organizations um, that are teaching our young people esports, e gaming. Um, you know, this there's a particular organization that has set up esports labs with computers, and the um, the woman who runs the organization, she her son is a famous gamer, um, millions of views of uh, subscribers on YouTube, and just millions of followers. And they're from this state, you know, they're the family. Um, lives here in Fircrest where I live, but the Black Future Co-op Fund and all of our donors and supporters are helping to inspire the next generation of e-gamers in this state. And that is a very um, lucrative industry. And I think about another organization that we are supporting that's providing perinatal support that's providing doula and midwifery services to black and refugee and immigrant women and, and their families and, and birthing people here in Washington state. And we're supporting organizations that are helping to um, protect the rights of our LGBTQ community. Um, and organizations that are that are legacy organizations, you know, black women who have been doing this work for decades and them being able to see this organization and to convene them and for them to be able to see so many other black women doing incredible work across Washington state. I mean, those are the things that inspire me um, about the work that this community that the, that the co op fund gets to. Um, uplift and share with the community and invest in and support and champion, but it's the diversity of solutions, the diversity of ways that we bring joy and care and strength and love and creativity um, that truly inspires me and makes me grateful to be one of the architects of this work. We have, a, I, I looked in the chat, we have a couple of grantees on this call. Hi, y'all. Um, but the, the, the other thing that I wanted to tell you that it's also doing is it's building trust among our people and, and making that, that connection. We, you know, so many things have happened to us in the historical context of this country. So even when we're like, yeah, 
trust-based philanthropy, no application, unrestricted funds, no strings. And, you know, people like leaning like, what's the catch? <laughs> sure? Are you sure this is for me? Like, they're going to tell me this and then no money's going to show up. You know, it's been really interesting for us to start doing some repair um, as a people about relationship and, and trust. And that's the other benefit. Um, that's the thing that gets me about doing this work is that connectivity and that relationship building and that trust building. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I would love to hear what truthful Black narrative you would tell if you had to tell it in a book. What truthful Black narrative I would tell? <clears throat> I probably would have to, um, there's many stories, so it'd probably be a collection of short stories from all of us, but I think it would certainly start or stem from, um, um, as uh, Andrea stated before, my grandmothers, both my um, paternal and, and maternal grandmothers, my paternal, my father's mother um, was um, a mother of seven, also took care of her, um, her sister's sons when um, she was unable to. All seven of her children um, are college graduates, some master's degrees, and all except for my father became educators. Um, my, my father chose a different path, but, that's a, but I will say he also did teach when he served in the military. So all of them were educators. Uh, and she did that by, um, by cleaning um, a white woman's house and helping to raise her children. And she and that white woman became very good friends, um, but and then on the side, her side hustle was um, selling her cakes, pastries, and, and pies. And, and then on my father, on my mother's side, um, my, my grandmother decided to leave her husband. My grandfather moved to Cal from Mobile, Alabama, moved to California with her, the last four of her children. She had 11 children and uh, purchased her own home and uh, was so proud to have paid off that home um, herself without help from anyone uh, by being a, uh, a nurse's assistant and at night cleaning uh, the rooms of the hotel up the street. Uh, and uh, we often talk about warriors uh, and those women were warriors. And I get to be descendants of them and live uh, um, uh, my life because of their sacrifice and effort. And so I think uh, I would certainly start and I, you know, maybe that would be a story because I think our story um, begins way before them. Um, but I think it would be a, a, co a collection of uh, wonderful warrior stories um, like, like them. Angela, the first time you and I ever had a conversation, you talked about being a good ancestor. And uh, I've never stopped thinking about that because I, I do believe it's important that we honor our ancestors. I mean, I think about how my ancestors had my back. And uh, just say a few words about why being a good ancestor is, is not just important, but it's, it's vital. I'm gonna tell you how it came up. So the night that I had sent a text to Michelle, I was ready to give up. I'm like, we have been fighting for so long and they just keep killing us. I quit. I sat in my office, my home office, like I quit. I'm not doing this. And then the other, other voice in my head said, if you quit, you will not be a good ancestor. You can rest, but you can't quit because somebody before you dealt with much worse and they didn't quit so that you can sit in your seat at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and go to all these fancy colleges and universities you went to. Somebody made decisions long before they even knew I would be here. And so I, I now think about, and we now think about the decisions we make today and what the ripple effect will be a hundred years from now when we're not here. And so our goal is to continue to hold ourselves accountable to those decisions so that the ripple effect is a positive thing, that the fund will be sustainable when all of us are gone, when pyramids gone, when the four architects are gone, it's able to be sustainable because we made choices 
looking beyond the front of our nose. We made choices thinking out a hundred years. We're fundraising thinking out 200 years, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so, you know, that, that's the piece around good ancestors. We can be tired, we can rest, we can't quit. And as good ancestors, like all of us are not always energized at the same time. So I'd be like, I'm tapping out, I have a lot going on and the others step in. And so that's also another good choice because we don't want to do poor quality work that means the ripple effect that we leave is that a whole bunch of people behind us are drowning, right? We don't want that type of ripple effect. And so always asking ourselves every day, is this decision something that's going to be, you know, that's going to determine positive impact in the future? I see a question about, is uh, our volunteer opportunities available for, uh, with the Black Future Co-op group? Not yet, I'm gonna say yet. However, engagement opportunities are available and potentially volunteer will depend on what the person wants to do. And so, I don't know, I, Andrew, do you wanna talk about the June 5th event briefly? Sure, so as Angela mentioned earlier um, in, a, in one of the, the questions that she was posing a response to, we have this Black Wellbeing and Beyond study that we've been working on over the past year. It's important that when the fund uh, makes decisions and how what informs where we go, how we do that, that it's informed by community. And so we've been gathering qualitative and quantitative data to understand what our Black community needs and even the conditions of our Black community in several pillars, the pillars that make up what people feel are well-being, right? Whether it's economic security, education, legal system, civic engagement, so on and so forth. And so we will be, because we committed to our community, that we will come to back to community to present what we've gathered before writing and publishing that report, because we will do that with you. And so Sunday, June 5th is an opportunity where we will present that data to the world, echo back to you what we thought we've heard during that data gathering before we go off and write and publish that report. So we have a series of exciting events planned that day. It's from 2 to 5 p.m partly virtual, partly in person, some will be pre-recorded. Um, we want this to be, as Angela said, a family affair where we touch as many Black Washingtonians, individuals and organizations across the state of Washington, where you're tuning in and you're hearing this, this data report out, um, you're gathering with people in your living room, you're gathering in your church, you're gathering at your community center, you are actually doing a talk back from the data that you've heard in your personal community. And so I say all that to say, we will need support in pulling all of that together. Um, we're in the throes of planning that, but please do go to our website, um, do complete the, um, there's a form to be added to our mailing list. We will update you on where we are with logistics and absolutely we will need your support. We want to touch as many black Washingtonians as possible across the state of Washington all 39 counties, because we're all across the state of Washington. Thank you, Angela. We are everywhere in Washington. Uh, what, what finally in these last remaining minutes, what is, uh, what do you want in terms of the future for uh, black Washingtonians? What kind of community do you see for us who live here um, in this state? in the city of Seattle, where it's a, we're a small percentage of the population, but um, we have a lot going on. So uh, what, what, what do you hope to see? What, what, what do you think the future will look like for us because of the Black Future Co-op? Yeah, well, we, when we established a fund and as we've been strategically planning, we established um, four areas of impact. And so what we see for um, Black Washingtonians is making sure that this fund is connecting Black communities for collective power. We want to make sure that we're doing everything that we can um, to have a unified effort to make sure that this is truly a co-op, that we are building a a uh, common agenda and that we are all fighting for change together. We also have um, set out to ensure, as we have talked about earlier, that we are promoting a truthful narrative and that we are 
um, uplifting and honoring the stories of all of our ancestors and relatives, our, our mothers, the fathers, the sisters and brothers, aunties and uncles, um, and that we're ensuring that we're carrying that legacy forward in the most responsible and intentional way. We also are doing this work so that we are investing in Black generational prosperity. And so this is all about um, funding Black-led organizations, um, and also um, supporting Black-led initiatives and things that benefit the Black community so that we are doing our part to strengthen um, the health and education and economic opportunity for Black people in the state. And then finally, we want to do philanthropy different. We want to shift the paradigm of philanthropy in this state. And um, it takes a lot of learning, a lot of intentionality, but we want to make sure, you know, even with things like our We See You grants, the way that we think about um, providing easy access to funds and making sure that the barriers are um, low or none, you know, at all to access those funds and, and just making sure that we are working um, collaboratively with community and that truly this is a cooperative effort. I mean, we think that those areas of impact will lead us um, toward Black liberation in this state. Um, and we invite everyone who is interested, um, who um, can also appreciate those areas of impact or our mission to join us in this work to help us to shape the future of our communities and workplaces um, here in Washington state. So it will literally take all of us um, and we have some ideas of how we can get it done, but we will continue to do the research and solicit the feedback from community to make sure that we are on the right track. And the use of the word co-op, just uh, how did that, why that particular word? It's important that as a community, we play a part. Um, if we're saying that we're here on behalf of our black community to resource our black community, it's not just about financial resources. The Black Future Co-op Fund wants to be a container where we provide, Angela mentioned earlier, we need healing practices in our community. We need cooperation, right? We need to be constructively collaborating. These are things that we also want to be working with our community on. We want to be know, we want to understand what's working in Yakima in terms of constructive collaboration that we can bring to Kitsap County. What's working in Pierce that we can bring to King? What's working in King that we can bring to Spokane? But we want to be a container where we are providing the resources and the vision for what it looks like to be um, a cooperative Black community working together, rowing together on our behalf. I know that we're not monolithic, but we do have a shared history of trauma. We want to cut through that trauma to ensure that we can constructively collaborate to achieve that, that vibrant and thriving world that we want to see for Black people. It's appropriate that the preacher got the last word <laughs> because we have talked for an hour. So that means our time is up. I, um, I, I just feel so full after listening to all of you. Um, and I appreciate, uh, this was a privilege uh, being uh, with you tonight. I, I hope those who listened and watched uh, not only learned something, but um, perhaps uh, are a little full themselves uh, of the spirit and the, uh, the connection to the past, the ancestors, and to the remarkable achievements of Black women in Seattle and in Washington State. So all of you, Michelle, Vivian, Tawana, Angela, Andrea, uh, my love to you all. Thank you all so much. Uh, the Black Future Co-op Fund is going to be a huge game changer uh, for Black communities in this state. So um, until the next time. And don't forget to look for these books at the Elliott Bay Book Company. Don't forget J. California Cooper. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Have Eric. Thank you, ladies. Thank you.